So, um, welcome to uh, the the newly revived part two of our workshop on augmented intelligence. We had an open discussion two weeks ago, and last week we had a hiatus, and now we're leaping in with two talks related to education, which is one of the main components for our vision for the workshop overall. Um, keeping with our, our standards, we will not uh, have a formal introduction introduction of Ken and Mitch, other than to say that uh, they were um, very committed speakers for uh, the people who are voting on speakers for the workshop. Um, and so we will go in the order of Ken Katinger and Mitch Nathan. So please take us away, Ken. Great. Um, yeah, very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about essentially two papers. One, the first one on uh, some surprising findings about human learning rate is in submission. And the second one we presented at the AI education conference I just mentioned that was in Durham this year. Thanks to uh, my many co-authors on these papers, also to NSF. I see Su Sang Lim is here. Uh, she was a, a cognizant program officer for Learn Lab, the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center, which will be featured into this in this talk. Um, and, and a number of people, including Rob, who gave some feedback on, on part one of this story. Um, so uh, in, in case you miss it in the details, here's my whole talk in, in a single slide. Um, I'm going to address this question, do students learn at different rates with 27 data sets we collected through uh, Learn Lab? I'll present a, a hybrid cognitive statistical growth model that we'll use to analyze that data and findings from the analysis, including uh, what uh, had seemed astonishing to me, a uh, regularity in the rate that students learn in these contexts. Um, also though, a uh, quite wide range of initial performance in students in these real classes. Um, so the, uh, the implications of these results seem to be that all students learn when given delivered practice opportunities, but that there are large inequities in preparation. And the second part of my talk addresses those inequities through a hybrid human computer tutoring approach. Uh, and I'll present uh, uh, our intervention as well as a quasi experiment that we ran spanning the pandemic year of 2020, where we saw a promising doubling of these diverse uh, math students uh, learning relative to a match control, and say a few things about our work going forward to scale that. Um, so on part one, do, stu do some students learn faster? Um, here's a quote from a National Academy of Science. This, uh, um, uh, a report that said uh, high ability learners learn at a more rapid rate than other students. Um, here's a, a quote from Benjamin Bloom. Most students become very similar with regard to rate of learning when provided with favorable learning conditions. Notice this favorable learning conditions. This is an important caveat here. Maybe the answer is yes, under unfavorable conditions and Bloom is right. And, and maybe the National Academy is right with that, with that caveat. I definitely thought yes when we engaged in this, and I was hoping we could leverage the Learn Lab in infrastructure to find the fast learners, identify what they're doing that makes them better learners, and then we could use that as a basis to teach learning to learn. Um, so uh, uh, let me start first by saying a little bit about the data. Um, Learn Lab's goal was to do basic research at scale by leveraging educational technologies embedded in wide use. Uh, um, uh, it, where we brought researchers um, into these school settings, college, uh, high school, middle school, to run uh, what we called in vivo experiments, or some people have called them now embedded in experiments, or even A-B tests in the context of those courses. Um, that's a whole other talk or two. But I'm going to focus particularly on the data we collected, about 300 at the end of this uh, uh, period, but it's, it's actually close to approaching 4,000 data sets now. Um, uh, why we only picked 27 is uh, goes to our selection criteria, which I, I will get at. Note, I'm going to be talking through a lot of slides fast. I've got slide numbers on every one of these. Feel free to write down, you know, slide eight. I don't know what you're saying, you know, um, as I go, if I'm going too fast. Um, 
So just to give you a sense for some of these, like one of the data sets is from this Kurt Van Lane's Andes physics tutor used in uh, the Naval Academy and other college level places. Um, the assessment math tutor used in middle school math in schools. Um, this battleship number line game was up on brain pop and used in upper elementary schools, sometimes with huge numbers like 10,000 kids over a, like a week or less. Uh, this English article practice tutor was used in college level second language learning courses for somewhat more advanced uh, English language learners trying to get our very difficult, you know, the uh, um, and uh, articles right. So across these 27 data sets, they vary quite a bit in domain. You can see that here, some language, some math, some science, interaction types not shown, but as I just illustrated, some are educational games, some are online courses, some are intelligent tutoring systems. Um, um, I think it's, it's uh, reasonable to say that they all provide pretty favorable conditions for learning. They're embedded in real courses and they provide deliberate practice. There's varied repetition with as needed feedback and instruction. Um, and many of them, them uh, most of them have been uh, iterated through various forms of research, cognitive task analysis, as well as experiments. And there's a, there's a lot of students and uh, even more uh, observations across these data sets, 1.3 million. Um, uh, so next, the model. I'm, I'm noticing a flag that there are some chat, but I can't see chat very good. Okay. Uh, we use I, I, chat um, not to ask media questions, but just to have a side discussion going on. Okay. Uh, well, if you see any clarification questions that I should address on the way, feel free to interrupt. Uh, so how are we modeling this data? Let me just walk you through this uh, intuitively first. We're going to model students' success on tasks, whether they get a task right on their first try without any assistance from the system, you know, no feedback yet um, or, or no hint request. If they make a hint request or make an error, they're, they're scored on that task. Or we, And some of these are unit tasks. They're steps and problems sometimes. Sometimes the problems only have, more, or, uh, you know, there's only one step or one question sometimes like that physics tutor every vector you draw in the free body uh, diagram is evaluated um so that will do that in proportion to an estimate of initial knowledge an estimate of learning rate and an estimate of opportunities and so the learning curve has sex success on the y-axis in these opportunities so these are prior opportunities to learn so our very first observation of a student on a um, knowledge component, which I'll define in a moment, um, means they've had no prior opportunities to learn, at least within the context of our observations. Um, so after one, after two, after three, this is one of those 27 data sets in the red. Um, this is the model uh, fit that I'm about to show you. Um, so initial knowledge is, that's the intercept, you know, think back to your algebra, learning rate is the slope of this curve. There's a little complexity though, that in that these curves are are curvy, right? Um, we don't want them going over one. So uh, it's easy to see initial knowledge, but learning rate, um, you know, if you just look at uh, um, the sort of rise over run, it changes as the curve goes up, right? So one way to deal with that, of course, is that, well, and this is especially important when we're trying to compare learning rates, for example, across students here, right? Um, you know, it's easy to see these intercepts. These two students are the same. They're both better, higher than the other two. It's a little tricky to see the slope. Like, um, you know, this one's better than that one, but what about uh, one versus three? Are any of these equal? It's pretty hard to see. Um, but uh, if we uh, transform this data using uh, the logistic function or log odds, um, um, you know, which is behind logistic regression, here's the log odds math. Now this is equal, not proportional to, right? We can straighten these lines out. So um, if we plot this exact same data now where we're used transforming success into log odds, the lines straighten out. And you can now see that actually uh, one is better than three in learning rate and two and four, which maybe didn't look that similar are indeed on this metric learning at about the same rate. Um, so this will help us visualize whether the intercepts are different and whether the learning rate or slopes are different. Um, so here now they're all constant and we can, in, an, in, in a simplification here, 
um, you know, in indicate which student has which intercept and, and which slopes. And, and in this example, we're seeing variation in both. Um, this is just an example. Um, so uh, a key part of this uh, model, though, is uh, an accurate cognitive model that characterizes transfer of learning in these unit tasks, which ones require the same uh, underlying cognitive processes or components of knowledge, we call those knowledge components. So to illustrate that, I've just made, uh, here are uh, uh, three problems, two steps each. And for each of the steps, so this is two times eight is 16, right? I've characterized different ways of encoding what's being transferred. You could say it's all arithmetic and then everything gets a one. That's Q matrix candidate zero. Um, uh, everything's the same. Sorry, my timer's going off. Um, here's a, 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 more, a slightly more refined one where it differentiates this step involves multiplication. This one involves subtraction um, and so forth, right? And uh, if, if I had more time, I'd love to probe you to see if you see other, any other distinctions. You might notice, oh, that was a negative number versus a positive number. Uh, so maybe we should distinguish that. Or this one, if you go left to right, you get it right. But this one, you go right to 30 minus 2. Oops, that's going to be wrong. So we can code that distinction between whether you need order of operations in the multiplication step or not. So th these now become different from that one or whether a negative uh, number processing is involved. So here's an alternative Q matrix. And um, at the other extreme from everything's the same is everything's different. And we call this the item model. So here are four different Q matrices. The key to accurate cognitive model is which one provides the best prediction fit to the learning curve data. And a big part of Learn Lab was to build out an infrastructure for doing this kind of refinement. And basically, you know, what we're able to do in these is, is find the best Q matrix through an iterative process. And um, then we use that Q matrix to elaborate this uh, growth model. So now I'm gonna expand initial knowledge and, and learning rate into a student component and a knowledge component uh, 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 part of it. And here we see this cognitive model, this mapping of task J to knowledge component K. And then this is essentially the difficulty or the ease of that knowledge component, the intercept value for that uh, knowledge component. And that shows up over here as well. In this is the um, knowledge component uh, part of the learning rate. And similarly, there are student parts of both the initial knowledge and the learning rate. Um, and so, uh, a key thing about these data sets is we made sure that all of them had good uh, cognitive models or KC models. They're the best cross-validated generalization to unseen tasks. So it's, it's uh, by the way, if you just do straightforward, which one gives you the best log likelihood or, or, or root mean squared error, it's going to be the most specific one. So it's key to do this uh, cross-validation generalization. Um, in all cases, there's at least three models involved and some many more. And in a number of these cases, we've closed the loop on this model refinement where we redesigned instruction based on a refined cognitive model and, and showed better learning as a consequence. And so we're picking um, uh, the best refined KC models in all these cases. Um, and they're not all perfect. And, and you may notice uh, uh, that uh, later on. Uh, um, if you're watching closely, uh, there's an Easter egg for you. Um, so uh, here are the findings. Good news um, and, and not so good news, I guess. Um, um, this uh, notion of learning rate, as I illustrated earlier, um, can be observed in this data by looking at whether these lines are parallel. And um, I, uh, as you can see on these four data sets, um, with some exceptions over here, they're pretty darn parallel. I was really struck by this and surprised by this. And I said it's good news, and I'll get to that in a second, but I was a little disappointed um, when this started to come out. The other thing you'll notice, is, uh, though, is a large variation in initial performance. Remember, these are students. These are embedded in classes, right? They, every student here is normally, you know, has the prerequisites, right? They belong in that class. 
you might hope that they are all a bit more similar than this, but they are quite variant. Uh, just to you know make that more clear, in this geometry high school geometry course, there's a there's a student starting around 27 percent correct, and another student starting over 88 percent correct. Um, this is an online college statistics course, maybe a little bit less variation there, but still pretty big, less than 50 up to about 88. Um, this shows um, more of these, each of the, these pairs of columns are the student learning rate graphs and the KC learning rate graphs. And I just wanted to show you the parallelism that's pretty consistent across these, boom, boom. boom. But also, if you look at the KC graphs, you see more variability. Um, and that is indicative that this model can ca capture variability in learning rate if it's there, right? It's, there is observed, much more observed variability in the learning rate per KC than it is per student. Um, you know, and some of these have some variation, but there's a lot of parallelism across. Here, here's the remaining data sets. So this, this I think, is a pretty striking finding. Um, uh, as I said, my original goal was to identify high-ability learners and understand their characteristics. Uh, it was surprising that we found these highly similar rates of learning across students. And I'll just insert for any uh, uh, young researchers out there, or, or maybe all of us, that um, I, I've noticed a number of times in my career, actually, research Mitch and I did years ago, where we saw that students were doing actually better at algebra story problems than at equations this was quite surprising, is that when things are, do not work as expected, you may really be onto something and stick with it. Because you, you know that's when science is often probing um, um, mysteries in the best way. Um, so uh, implications here, all students learn when given deliberate practice opportunities and, and you know we could probe more what that means here, but there are large inequities in, in preparation. So I'm gonna transition now to the second part of this talk. Does hybrid human computer tutoring address these? Probably this audience uh, you know, knows about various uh, uh, ed educational equity things, but let me just first uh, um, give you uh, the claim here. Uh, given learners are supported in two ways with favorable learning conditions for deliberate practice, and they're also supported in investing effort in getting sufficient learning opportunities, engaging the sufficient learning opportunities, then it seems, according to this data, anything anyone can learn anything they want. But they need to have support, not just in favorable learning conditions, but investing the effort to, to be involved. So uh, it, beyond existing schooling, if we could bring well-designed online learning technologies to help provide these favorable learning conditions, and what we've begun to try to do is bring human tutors or mentors to support, especially the student effort side of things. So there's a bit of cognitive motivation collaboration here across technology and people. Um, uh, many sources of evidence of uh, achievement gaps of various kinds, like this is in the National Assessment of Educational Progress is showing over many years, a large uh, white black uh, achievement gap. Um, I think many of you have seen that. Um, we see uh, opportunity gaps in our AI uh, computer tutors, like our math cognitive tutors. These things work when students use them, but they don't work when students don't use them. They can't help students if they're not using them. Um, and so, you know, we see these dosage graphs all the time. The more students spend on the tutors, the higher they achieve. But we, you know, the not great news is there's often students here at the at the low end. So what can we do? There's lots of great research in social psychology on various ways to help students put in more time and effort. Um, they need to have a growth mindset. They believe that believe that the effort will pay off. They they need to feel like they belong. They need to recognize that uh, that math will be useful in their future. It helps uh, to to feel like they're in a strong supportive relationship and that they're not. Um, feeling that uh, uh, stereotype threat. So all of these are research areas with, with good sets of prior research that supports them. Can we get these ideas 
uh, two um, human mentors and, and do it in a cost-effective way. So the Personalized Learning Squared project, which was funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, has been a project we've been working on for a few years to, to, to pursue this idea of complementary strengths. Um, and by using tutors, uh, we can add learning opportunity support uh, beyond you know, what's also in schools. Um, further, we can use data from the AI tutors to, uh, to support the, the, the human tutors by signaling students who may have issues with effort and progress. And we can also provide resources to enhance their tutoring skills. Um, and, and we've been addressing particular uh, populations of students that um, are in uh, low income or minoritized kinds of situations. Um, so you can think of this PLUS app or PL2 as we were used to call, it, we started to call it PLUS now. It's kind of like a Fitbit for learning. It provides students and tutors with uh, progress and effort indicators on a weekly basis. And this is Alex as a tutor and he's got these students mm -hmm. and some of them have not met their effort goals. They're in the missed you category. Some have met effort goals, but haven't met pro progress goals. And this can help Alex decide who he's gonna help in what way, maybe more cognitive help here, more motivational help here. Um, with respect to how to help, we're bringing that, those insights from social psychology to bear in a set of resources that are increasingly interactive resources. We're basically building tutors for uh, better tutoring. They're scenario-based learning by doing activities where you put a tutor in a tutoring situation and say, what would you do? We, we use this kind of predict, observe, explain pedagogical approach where it's you know right from the start embedded in, in learning by doing in real scenarios, realistic scenarios and give them feedback and ask them to reflect on, on why the uh, suggested actions are correct. So PLUS has been supporting a, a number of different out of school tutoring programs um, with both you know, human tutor uh, um, involvement and computer tutor involvement. I'm gonna zero in on some evaluations we did with the Center for Urban Education's Ready to Learn program. Um, that's an after school and summer math mentoring program that blends these approaches and uses uh, undergrads at Carnegie Mellon and, and, and University of Pittsburgh as the tutors. Carmen and Cassandra were the supervisors and they provided a lot of the um, support that goes beyond the technology. Uh, groups of tutors and students would meet together starting off with relationship building activities. And then each tutor works with four students, two at a time, are working with that tutor and the other two are working on, uh, on the practice environment and then they swap and then there's some more uh, uh, reflection and, and relationship building activities afterwards. So these such sessions were occurring um, after school and during the summer during this period of, of evaluation, um, essentially from the fall and winter of the, this school year to the subsequent school year. And what we're gonna compare is students who were involved in this treatment uh, with students from the same schools who weren't. Um, the students who were involved were from three local urban schools specifically selected to be needy. Um, and the, was, uh, uh, the population was mostly sixth and seventh graders, uh, half female, uh, mostly black, some brown, some white students. Um, to create a control group, we had at those schools some 500 other students who were at those schools. But uh, if you look at the white dots, these are their characteristics on various dimensions we looked at. They weren't matching. So propensity matching selected a subset of 300 students from that 500 that produces a much more matched result. So in our sample, controlled uh, propensity matched control, um, they, they're very similar in their prior characteristics. I'll, I'll show you results from the unmatched control as well. Um, so uh, we use the NWEA um, math test, as I said earlier. Um, the match control grew over this year period by 3.6. The treatment grew by 6.8, about a doubling effect, effect size 0.4, statistically reliable. The unmatched control, um, you know, this reflects that sampling uh, of, of uh, less well-supported 
students in the match control, right, have lower performance. And this is a uh, the NWEA math map test has uh, suggests that sixth and seventh graders should gain about five point four five points in a in a year. So the treatment students actually surpass that. So seems quite promising results. Another thing we did in the quasi uh, experimental res, uh, realm is um, use this non-equivalent dependent variables idea, which is to say, if we have a selection effect such that the students entering in this program are good you know, learners or getting more support from their parents, we'd expect them to grow in their reading scores too. But this, the treatment isn't addressing reading. So if, if we've got a good sample, we would not expect reading score increase. And indeed, that's what we found. It's no significant reading score increase. So helping us, of course, a random experiment's better, but this was a, a nice way to give us progress information. So we're trying to make it more affordable. I mentioned the scenario-based training. Um, high impact tutoring has got a lot of evidence for it, suggesting that it can have big impact, but it is costly. We, we're hoping to get it down to $500. I'm super excited about a, a strategy we've developed to integrate this tutoring um, into the school day by having remote superhuman well-trained tutors who can zoom into schools uh, um, when, uh, when and help students who need who have particular needs. So that's it. Uh, there's my summary. You've seen that before. Um, thank you again to uh, all many great collaborators as well as a big support staff on the team. And uh, I'll, I'll put that slide there and take questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Ken. That was a, a wonderful talk, uh, packing in a whole bunch of information rather rapidly. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on the side that you should have ignored and you did. Um, but uh, I'd like to open it up. Uh, so there's great questions from um, like Danielle and Cody and Jana, Jan, Ig. So I let I don't know if I have to call on them. I saw Cody's question early. Do you want to ask that, Cody? Are you here? Sure. Hi, Ken. Hi, Cody. Um, so the, the it's about the model. Uh, I was surprised to see learning modeled as a linear function. Um, it's sort of what happened with the history of the power law of learning here. Why is it not modeled as a power law? Well, because of this log transformation, it's actually closer to exponential. Um, and you may know that literature on the power law repealed and so forth. Um, uh, if, if we take the log of opportunities, um, then that looks a bit more like a power law. An important difference from that, that literature, by the way, is that literature was based getting to enough accuracy where we can focus on how fast you are when you're correct. This is on the earlier phase. Um, yeah, and it's an interesting question whether uh, this exponential uh, uh, formulation, right, with the log over here, it, it, it'd be exponential on this side, right? Um, maybe it's better as a power law, and, and we've done some preliminary analyses where we would put the log on the opportunities. It makes interpretation harder, um, uh, but that's a good future work, work effort. I, you know, I think with respect to the theory development, characterizing why big intercept differences but small slope intercept with slope differences is a huge theoretical challenge that this data suggests i have some thoughts about that but does that help yeah thank you um yeah i'm just curious but if i may i have another um question related to the topics and the tasks um what is the range of topics that you cover Chinese math, yeah. fraction, number line, English articles. This is a STEM college course, college statistics. There's a computer science. There's a bunch of them on fractions. Um, this table gives you some sense. And then this is the different grade levels. Okay. Okay. So the consistency, uh, would you expect the consistency to be um, to change if you get out of this set of topics? So how how much this consistency relates to the topics that the data sets are? Well, if I'm allowed to generalize from 27 contexts, 
when when we often generalize from one, <laughs> um, I would be tempted to say that yeah, that's I mean, math, science, language, pretty representative of of um, at all these levels is reasonably rep well representative of all kinds of academic domains. So, I I guess my incoming hypothesis would be yeah, uh, this would be true in other domains. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. There is some variation. By the way, fast talk here, but if we compare the model with and without in data sets with and without this student slope, um, it tends to provide better predictive fit when it's present than it, when it isn't, um, maybe on two thirds of the data sets. So I'm not trying to say there, you know, there's no variation. It's just surprisingly small. Um, relative to all the other sources of variation. The four other sources in this of variation in this model are much bigger. Um, but there are differences, and you know, you can see them in some of these graphs. Yeah, the initial knowledge is pretty interesting uh, to me because this it sort of indicates that maybe the power function is prior to where you tested them, right? Meaning if you were to take someone that has really very little knowledge about the topic, then you might be able to say a, to see a nonlinear function, sort of like you are bringing them with some knowledge already. They don't start in zero, right? Well, to be clear, this is a nonlinear function. I'm just showing a transformation that makes it look linear, right? I mean, you can take a power law and make it look linear or an exponential and look linear by changing the axes, right? This axis is in, in, in log scale. So it's an exponential function transformed to look linear. If you, if you put log opportunity on the bottom, we do the same for a power function. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dan Danielle next. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. But finish your thought, Ken, if you want. Well, what's happening before? I mean, one of the things we started to look at is, um, are there rate differences for students who have less prior knowledge, like these students versus these students? And uh, the preliminary result there was not as much as we expected. Like, sometimes you might, you might expect, like, if these students got here because they learned faster, then we'd expect them to learn faster afterwards. And we do see that kind of rich, getting richer in some data sets, but this one's some, somewhat the opposite, right? And maybe there's a bit of a, a flora effect there, but uh, um, yeah, so enough on that. Danielle. Uh, so uh, it, it's related to that. Um, a couple of things. Um, one of the things has to do with your data set, and I would have assumed that there were um, experiments embedded in the studies where they com were comparing interventions that they expected one intervention to do better than another. And so, for example, I start, you see sharper learning curves for low knowledge and less skilled than for high knowledge because they have more to gain. And um, uh, because that's what it's designed for, to help those students. And so I would have thought that you would have uh, looked at um, each study as a function of the uh, conditions. Um, along the same lines, um, remarking on the patterns that we see, um, did you um, also think about sorting um, the, the studies that showed um, less linear patterns or um, more differential patterns to see if there were some some uh, aspects of the studies that might stick out. Because so, for example, were the language um, studies did they happen to show more differential patterns, or did studies? Yeah, I think there's tons of opportunities on that second point um, uh, to to try to find. Uh, other kinds of phenomena. One I'm particularly interested in is in some of these domains, like there's a Chinese vocabulary one, it's very much fact learning and memory is the key. Others involve skill induction, you know, where you have to generalize across contexts. Others involve more reflective sense-making. 
And I suspect that you're going to see faster learning rates going from the first to the second to the third, because it, as you go from memory to skill induction, you don't leave memory behind. You still have to remember those skills. And as you go to sense making, you need the skills and the memory as well. So um, it is the case that the Chinese domain, um, I guess it's not in this table, but um, these are actually sorted by the median learning rate within each data set. And the Chinese da data set has the, by far the fastest learning rate. So maybe there is something that in fact, contexts learning goes faster than in skill than in uh, principle or sense-making contexts. Okay, um, I'm going to take my prerogative as moderator to cut off the uh, exclusively Ken conversation to be resumed after Mitch's talk. So I'd like to transition to Mitch Nathan. Perfect. And uh, everybody sees, can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, can I make it so that you're seeing just the slide though? Let's see. There we go. Well, I didn't know there was all that animation. There might be random animation. Who knows? Um, Ken, uh, really awesome talk. I will actually reference it uh, a little bit later um, in this thesis. And I guess what I'm really offering here, less than uh, a finished product, is uh, a set of thoughts about the role of AI as it is emerging within education. So AI, of course, has been around in education for a really long time. <laughs> and we've seen some examples um, just in this prior talk where it's a little bit, was a little bit hidden in this particular talk, but um, those of you who are familiar with the cognitive tutors know that it's doing a lot of uh, decision-making uh, about content, about hint offering and things like that. And, um, and that's been a very effective and powerful way for, uh, for AI to help us uh, address education. What I think is happening though is more and more educational leaders uh, are starting to turn to AI for even things beyond just the content learning. So, um, so let me just um, sort of frame this as saying that I'm gonna offer a set of propositions uh, that are about uh, some of the emerging roles of AI in education. And um, what I wanna say by emerging roles is um, certainly more and more uh, AI is playing a role in personalizing learning for students. Um, it's offering uh, more rapid response time for things like feedback or even things like analyzing student work. But it's also starting to be brought into managing the complexity of the range of student data that educational leaders are being asked to do. So certainly there's teachers who are doing some of this, uh, but there's also principals, superintendents, and a variety of uh, also administrative people. So they're taking in information about, for example, the student demographics, like we, we saw um, things about race and socioeconomic status and perhaps gender get used, um, obviously, um, some of the really easy pickings that have been traditional grades, attendance, time on task, but also now more and more we're seeing it delving into areas of multimodal data. So uh, what's in a chat that's going on during um, interactive classroom learning or online classroom learning, uh, clicks and talk time, actual content of speech, right? So uh, I see Art and Danielle are here. Um, they uh, certainly have been looking a great deal at this kind of thing. And with the uh, pro proliferation of lower cost and more effective sensors, more attention to student movement, gestures, eye gaze, facial expressions, even aspects of collaboration. 
let's see how I make my slide change. Okay, so um, when we start to take an embodied lens on some of these, uh, we can start to ask about uh, these questions of how much can these AI systems really process in ways that we would normally think of them from our human perspective. So uh, many people I'm sure who are here are very aware that uh, <clears throat> there are these ideas of grounded and embodied learning. And one core proposition is that the meaning that humans make is grounded in their affective sensory motor experiences that are interpreted within a socioculture, sociocultural context and a historical context. And when you um, extend that to AI, you start to wonder about um, what its roles are. Another really important idea that comes out of this embodied perspective is the idea of extended cognition and the fact that human intelligence is fundamentally limited and that in order to manage uh, the complexity of many uh, kinds of phenomena, um, we are going to often exceed uh, one's cognitive abilities uh, of the people who are involved in these. And so people will draw on external resources, which can include, of course, other people, which can include various um, tools and resources, including um, AI systems. So um, AI um, often is characterized by the algorithms that make it work. And if you buy into this embodied lens, then what you come away with is that human meaning making um, is not supported by ungrounded symbol systems. And this is often a very core part of the embodied cognition kind of argument that it is uh, trying to reframe the nature of cognition um, so that it is not uh, formed by uh, these ungrounded symbol systems, but in fact draws more heavily on these sensory motor. Uh, systems, cultural systems, and social interactions that happen. So we're then faced with these, what I would call disembodied artificial intelligences. And a proposition that follows from that is that AI programs being constructed by these symbolic systems um, certainly can perform many complex tasks, but uh, may not be able to understand the human embodied interactions the way humans can. <clears throat> so we start to come up against this um, uh, ethics evidence equity uh, framework. We want to offer evidence-based support for education. We want to distribute resources equitably and we wanna be ethical about those and so we run into this question of the trustworthiness of these AI systems and how much they will be able to uh, meet the aspects of this ethics evidence equity framework. So um, this is of course a topic of great discussion. Um, there's this report from the European Commission's high level expert group on artificial intelligence that's come out. Um, many other reports one could look at as well. Um, AI needs to be based on human-centered design and adhere to ethical principles throughout its life cycle, which includes respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability, which essentially has to do with how well we understand how the AI systems are reaching the decisions they're reaching. So, um, so I think about this in terms of education and I um, imagine AI in kind of at least three key roles um, historically. Mm. Traditionally, AI has been seen as a tool. Um, it's often uh, designed to perform very specific tasks. 
often under the direction of humans, uh, think of expert systems or another, another, a number of other kinds of applications. Uh, so this tool use, we can sort of understand how um, ultimately humans are responsible for how it is being used uh, to make decisions. AI can also be described as an agent, um, and in that sense, even somewhat of an autonomous agent. Um, and the computing power has kind of raised this prospect that AI can serve as autonomous agents, where the responsibilities for consequential decisions are made without human intervention or oversight. Now, of course, there's a whole body of fictional literature on this, um, but um, AI, is being looked at more and more with this in mind. Um, uh, autonomous uh, driving is of course one example. Um, in education, we're starting to see the proliferation of commercial tools that have some of these qualities. One example for Little Trees um, takes in a lot of multimodal data um, and they advertise it as uh, doing emotion detection and choosing to uh, the interventions that uh, should occur as a result of this. Uh, however, one of the things we know is that um, it's quite variable in terms of the ways it processes things like eye gaze and facial expressions across uh, children from different cultures and uh, different socioeconomic circumstances. We're also starting to hear more and more about examples uh, where AI serves as a partner. So these are AI human partnerships, uh, alternative models um, that um, describe a kind of augmented intelligence. So I use the symbol, the AI plus augmented intelligence. Um, and these have some really promising approach to really hard problems in society, for example, in education and healthcare. So I'll talk about some of these examples. Um, <clears throat> Well, one idea is that you've got AI that can do this uh, omnipresent uh, attending to complex patterns of behavior uh, from these rich multimodal data streams uh, and can process them rapidly um, and then turn over um, aspects of that um, to human beings who do meaningfully interpret those, uh, those streams or um, summaries of those streams. Um, and the humans are able to empathize with the circumstances in which um, these patterns of behaviors arise uh, and then can have um, natural embodied interactions with the students um, who are generating these streams of data. So some interesting examples of this, um, certainly uh, some are emerging in healthcare where trustworthiness is a very important uh, point. Um, and, um, and I think that they've been thinking about this uh, a bit longer than we have in education, excuse me. Um, so you've got human clinical decision-making, but drawing on a lot of uh, pre-processing and a lot of information that's coming at them um, from AI kind of partners. Um, there's uh, probably some people are familiar with a pretty uh, well-publicized example uh, in this uh, study published by Obermeyer in Science in 2019 um, that used historical uh, healthcare data to make actually um, significant recommendations about access to uh, health services, including health services that are known to be very effective, and that many of these services were systematically excluded uh, from Black patients because of how it was interpreting these uh, prior trajectories of accessing healthcare facilities. Um, let me hearken to Ken's uh, wonderful presentation um, that offers, I think, a really great uh, example in, in education of these kind of augmented intelligence systems. So the idea that we're moving toward uh, thoughtful uses of hybrid human computer tutoring um, is, is really an excellent example of the potential of this. Um, you, we see inequities that um, can be not only promoted, but um, there's maybe even some suggestion that sometimes offering these very effective uh, support systems in education might even 
exacerbate um, achievement gaps uh, because you've got populations who are better positioned for all sorts of reasons, um, both in and outside the classrooms to make use of the supports that are given by AI driven tutors like those in um, Learn Lab and the cognitive uh, tutoring program. And so you can then use information from these interactions with these AI driven tutoring systems to uh, call on humans to help close the opportunity gaps. Um, and these, as we saw in the prior talk, uh, can lead to substantial learning gains. Um, I guess we didn't really see how that matched to the uh, achievement gaps uh, that were there, but I think we can imagine that these are steps toward uh, substantially reducing those gaps. Uh, there's also a wonderful example coming out of work from the people at UPenn, uh, Ryan Baker, Stephen Hutt, and uh, I want to call them out as uh, folks I've talked a lot about these topics with. Um, uh, this is a uh, uh, a program called detector driven interviewing. So the idea is that you have AI systems monitoring student behavior uh, for a variety of cognitive and affective patterns of behavior um, and identifying certain kinds of potential events um, that uh, might be related to learning and engagement. Um, and uh, for example, things like frustration, identifying trouble spots, um, We've also been talking about their ability to identify insights uh, and other um, positive kinds of events. Uh, the idea then is that these detectors alert human interviewers who then come in and do uh, this personalized natural interaction with the students right at moments after these events have occurred. Um, primarily at this point, they're being used for research purposes to better understand the uh, antecedents and states of the learner when these events occur. Um, but I think there's some even greater potential um, for these to be used uh, in a variety of ways. Um, one example setting that uh, this has already been used. Um, so a little shout out to Gautam and his project of Betty's Brain um, is that they've been used to improve uh, responsiveness that uh, can then be shown to enhance students' engagement uh, when these humans are alerted through these automated detectors. So, um, so this has the potential to really improve uh, our models of how cognitive and affective processes together shape learning um, and also have some, I think, real potential for future to customize pedagogical supports. So just a few concluding remarks, and then I really want to invite some discussion about uh, these topics. Um, AI, of course, has many areas in which uh, it can make contributions uh, to complex problems. There are also risks to um, autonomous disembodied AI um, making consequential decisions around people's lives. And in my case, uh, my interest in the decisions they make around education. And when um, I apply an embodied lens, um, it leads me to explore these questions of how augmented intelligence can be a way to really enhance our ability to capitalize on the strengths that um, AI systems provide and the strengths that humans provide to provide um, a, a combined way of supporting learning. So I think there's really great promise for education. And I also think it raises a number of uh, significant questions uh, of when to uh, create these um, partnerships between AI and humans and how to achieve this to achieve um, some of the uh, learning gains that we hope to happen through educational settings. So thank you all for listening. I look forward to our discussion. Great. Um, so yeah. We can um, open it up for a discussion. I recommend first, if anybody has a, a relatively Mitch specific question, to get it on the table, uh, how these things usually 
end up panning out is that we migrate without anybody ever saying to a group discussion of both of the talks. Um, so I, I do have a question, Mitch, relative to your framing in terms of embodied cognition. Um, and for, uh, tying it a little bit with Ken's talk, to what extent do you think of like Ken's knowledge components, these KCs, as uh, kind of latent variables to account for variability in students' performance across problems versus having to be inherently embodied <laughs> understandings that you can only get to through um, through knowing what somebody's body is like, knowing what their effective response is, et cetera. So I'm, I'm wondering, because there's a, a tenor that I get from Ken's talk that these cases could be kind of anything as long as they're cognitive components that you can identify, whereas I think that you're arguing for something which is far more constrained by understandings of what our bodies do. I, I mean, I think where the analysis of these knowledge components come into play is really, I think, interesting and um, how much various analyses point to some of the more multimodal qualities in which uh, students interact with content. Um, so it might be interesting, for example, to go through uh, like a taxonomy of knowledge components in a domain, like say um, in a domain of mathematics and see where these have already been, uh, already have multimodality folded into them um, and where they may have um, been done in a way that's more exclusive of that. Um, so uh, I think that would really add a lot to this discussion. If that, if that speaks to your question. Um, I, I see Michael Swart is on and um, there might be other people from my lab, but one of the interesting things we've been observing um, is how students use gestures to express their knowledge about um, their mathematics, um, how they do this to teachers and how they do this to one another. And we've also done um, some pretty rich statistical analyses of students who aren't just giving their uh, assessment information through writing or typing, but through um, multimodal interviews where we allow and even encourage them to use their bodies as they describe what they know about various topics. And um, some of these topics you know, can span a, a range of uh, ability levels, but consider even something um, as rich as students describing their mathematical insights and their proofs and justifications in a secondary math topic like geometry. So um, what's really interesting there is when we form our models of student understanding and learning, we get stronger models when we incorporate gesture information from our video analyses than we do if we just process what they say. And not only do we get better fitting models to their performance, but it also shows they know more. So that is at least one piece of the argument that there's information about student knowledge and reasoning that we need to take into account if we want to have rich and accurate um, models for describing thinking and learning. I see Michael has his hand up. So Michael, please jump in. Um, and Yon as well. So maybe uh, Michael then Yon. Yeah, I just want to comment real quickly. Uh, I, I don't know if it's Yana or Jana, um, but made a, a great point about uh, the, the accessibility of information through multimodality. And I would say that in our lab, 
instead of thinking of embodiment as a constraint, I feel like over the course of the work that we're doing, we're starting to see that embodiment as a, as a notion of multimodality is actually about expanding access by providing them with more channels for expressing what they know. Great, thank you, Michael. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean Jan to cut you off, but I figured Michael was gonna make a very relevant point. So please. Uh, I have a question for Ken. So I'm uh, surprised to see this discrepancy between the micro and macro levels of knowledge. That is, you see homogeneity of learning curves at the macro level, but you see heterogeneity at the micro level. I think you should not see um, heterogeneity at the micro level. If, if that is real, then you should see that at the macro level as well. So I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Which, which... So when you look at knowledge um, components, uh -huh. you see different uh, learning curves. But when you look at knowledge in general, you see the same rate of learning. Oh, the, the contrast is with disaggregating by students. Right. So the variation okay. across students is, 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 is small in, in, the, in the slopes. Uh, it, I mean, so you see, different... I, I don't, I think that's equally fine grained in the sense that, you know, if, if actually more fine grained, because usually there's more students in these data sets than there are knowledge components. So that's more disaggregated in some sense. Well, I, I agree that we're talking about um, differences between students. Right. But you see in the graphs you showed, you see that some of those curves are parallel and some are not. I thought the difference between those two cases is that first you're looking at their general problem solving and then you're looking at knowledge components. Yeah, well, one of the reasons, this is the Easter egg, one of the reasons there is variation in the knowledge component curves is imperfections in those models. Right. Um, theoretically, none of those lines should go down. If, if they go down, we have not appropriately identified the knowledge component that all the tasks coded by that knowledge component aren't the same if it's going down, right? right. It means, and, and often this happens because like one example in our prior research that uh, was in these geometry problems where you have to find an irregular shape combining formulas. And we had scaffolding in the early phases for that. Like, what's the area of the square? What's the area of the circle? Okay, now what's the irregular cutout, right? In our later problems, the scaffolding was removed. And in that case, the, the error rate actually went up when the scaffolding was removed. But then when we recode the knowledge component to say, oh, when the scaffolding's there, you don't need a planning knowledge component because it's being done for you, right? In the, when the scaffolding's gone, you have to do the planning. When we separate, now we get uh, that, that one curve that was you know, going down in success rate becomes two curves that now go up in success rate. So that's part of the variation on the KC is that the models are still not, you know, could still be refined. And, and could it be that the models don't have sufficient data to be estimated properly? Well, that's end? why, you know, we picked these 27 data sets because uh, they're, they've been through a level of iteration. All of them, all the knowledge component models at least beat two others, at least beat the two extremes that everything's the same and everything's different. Many of them, though, have like, you know, 20 different knowledge, uh, uh, you know, Q matrices that we we explored, you know, and there's a lot of data sets out there that don't have very good knowledge component models. And I think the estimations of student learning rate would be harmed um, by that, right? Part of the instrument has to get the knowledge component. Uh, right, you know, which is really a theory of transfer. It's saying what pract practice on what tasks leads to better performance on what other tasks. That's basically what we're trying to say, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. So I'm hoping that um, some of the discussion will be um, advanced to uh, oral discussion by like Celia or Art.
or Tony or Jana? Who goes first? Art. Okay. <clears throat> so this is, I guess, for Mitch. Um, I've, we're hearing so much discussion about the metaverse and particularly in India and China, that sort of technology is catching wildfire and new conferences are coming up on it. And I could see that this could be a way of uh, embodying embodiment or virtually embodying embodiment. But I also wonder if anything will be lost. I, I don't know all the details like if you, um, and there can be AI agents in there and there can be motion capture, presumably. So have you given much thought to the different ways um, that this metaverse may uh, expand uh, some of the embodiment research and learning? It's a great question. I, I gave a real brief um, response in the chat, but it's easier to talk. Um, Am I coming through? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Art, great question. So, I don't pretend to know all of the uh, capabilities the metaverse is or plans to support, um, but we currently have uh, a grant um, that is a collaboration with Candace Walkington and her team at Southern Methodist University, where we're comparing um, VR and AR to things like direct manipulation, like for example, direct manipulation software that you can use on a tablet or on an interactive whiteboard um, versus just face-to-face. -face. Um, and, you know, we're starting to learn some pretty interesting things. So one just, so just make some real generic um, kind of observations. One is there's a lot of benefits to AR that I uh, foresee above VR for a lot of collaborative learning because you're actually then um, interacting more directly with the people and they see all the nuances of your body and facial expression in ways that are very hard right now to still capture in VR. Um, I'm sure that VR is, you know, moving on that way, but in, in the end, you're kind of like you show up as like a, for people who aren't less familiar, you show up as kind of a cartoon avatar. So it's whatever the programmer has sort of allowed for the degrees of freedom of face and, and movement. And so you lose a lot of things like finger articulation um, in most VR settings. You certainly lose a ton of facial expression, whereas people can pick up really subtle things with uh, fingers, hands, and faces um, when they can see people. So, so that's an important consideration, but it is an interesting thing as we think about how we're um, asking uh, learners' minds to like kind of reframe what it means to be in a space with others. And um, at first it's kind of awkward, but over time uh, people get pretty good at it. And um, I'm guessing it's gonna be one of these, it could be like a generational, thing, um, you know, where you're going to have um, generations growing up in these headset based kinds of environments where they do feel very much like um, they're interacting very directly with objects and very directly with with people in in environments, even though locatively they're actually removed. So um, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you have thoughts there. I, I don't know if I've spoken to what you're you're asking in general, or if you have some other thoughts, I know you've been toying. No, with no, this is, this is it. And motion capture, I wonder whether it captures those subtleties of the hand movements and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. the avatar will capture all of that and record it and you can analyze it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Right, we're, we're seeing really fast growth in motion capture. Um, so much so that we're moving away from even specialized sensors. Uh, because um, algorithms using even just um, onboard cameras on laptops um, are starting to um, catch up and perhaps even exceed some of those, unless you wear a lot of specialized equipment, you know, like you wear gloves and mm -hmm. things like that, which is a very uncomfortable and costly thing to imagine for uh, for educational settings. Thanks. Um, for very high for very high capacity things, like if you're gonna do surgery, you know, um, or, you know, some complex um, technical work, you, you know, the motion capture thing may ultimately be better. So. 
Hi, Mitch, can I chip in? Um, I'm intrigued by the embodiment lens as you described it. And I wonder whether you could say more about what you think is the um, active ingredient, as it were, what is gained by taking, you know, a fairly radical view about the fundamental nature of cognition um, relative to what I took to be more like Ken's perspective and a more conventional perspective, which is acknowledging that, for example, affective variables and maybe socio uh, sensory motor processes are important, but seeing them as distinct. And also, so one question is about the active ingredient and the other one is about for whom adopting the embodiment lens is an advantage? Could it be that it's especially helpful for the individual interacting with an AI system, whether or not it's advantageous for a researcher theorizing the relationships between humans and AI systems? Yeah, uh, a great set of questions and points that I really deserve both a discussion here and probably a discussion over a, a adult beverage uh, at some point in the future. Um, I guess if I had to uh, narrow down the active ingredient, and there might be more than one, um, I think one way to think of it is this notion of um, what people like um, Jurgo Engstrom has referred to as the factoring assumption. So the question uh, that I think we all can imagine is, can we factor out the influences of uh, body movement, factor out the influences of context and culture? We just not to say we ignore them, but we treat them as factors in a model that are separable versus whether we reject the factoring assumption and believe that there's something holistic about human behavior and human experience uh, that is lost when you try to sort of take the pieces apart. And um, I really like Larry Shapiro, if you know his, Lawrence Shapiro, if people don't know Larry, Lawrence Shapiro uh, has a wonderful book called Embodied Cognition. He's a philosophy of mind um, philosopher. Um, talks about this in terms of something called the uh, constitutional hypothesis of whether um, you, can simply separate out these constituent elements um, that make up uh, cognition and still be left with models that describe the entity itself. So, um, so there's certainly a spectrum of views within the embodied cognition community. Some who believe you absolutely cannot do separability and maybe on the very far extreme you have phenomenologists some who believe you absolutely can, um, and they do so even um, with, um, with mathematical models and computer models. Um, and then there's just a lot of complexity in between. Now, let me ask your second question, which is who you think, who, who I might think, I guess, benefits most from this embodied perspective. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of my work is in educational settings, um, I want to say, that um, it certainly matters a great deal whether teachers do or don't have this embodied perspective on their students and even on their own behavior in the classroom. So let me give you another example of a study, uh, some, some empirical work we've done um, where we're looking at how teachers evaluate students' understanding of mathematical ideas before or after we attune them to students' gesture behaviors. And what happens there is teachers develop very different perspectives on whether students understand a topic or not. Well, if they do or don't notice and incorporate into their interpretation, this is kind of like formative assessments, right? Um, the, the way students think about mathematics. Um, one of the dramatic things is that teachers actually are often over inclined to say students do understand a concept if they say the right mathematical word or term or phrase, but sometimes their gestures give away that they're carrying an incorrect metaphor for something. Um, 
that then can have like negative consequences later on because they either fail to understand something or they just, you know, can't uh, reason the way we would like them to reason mathematically. And when they get to this more uh, rich um, or nuanced um, way of looking at students' talk, when that talk includes their body movements, um, they also give more nuanced interpretations of the knowledge states of their students. So I think that's also true of peers when they're working together, but I would first put that burden on teachers who really do have the most responsibility in the learning environment for what's going on. I hope that speaks to, at least in a short way, your question. Absolutely, very helpful, thank you. Sure. I have a bit of a follow-up to that, but I'm, uh, Brian, I think was next. Yeah, I didn't know whether to <clears throat> jump in or not. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, a postdoc in CogSci with Politian, uh, but my life is in the IEEE Computer Society. Um, we are going through some pushback on machine learning and other AI flavored approaches where there's this growing belief that um, ways of anthropomorphizing something that is essentially an algorithm kind of antagonizes the theory of mind module, if you will, and creates unreasonable expectations, people will sort of backfill a story of cognition that's really not present in the interface or the algorithms we have today. So to what what level is this an ethical question? Uh, you know, are we getting people to believe that, you know, our um, you know, our robot is essentially too human uh, than, you know, than the algorithm can support. I, it's not really a question, I guess, but I want to um, say I, I appreciate your insights and I think, uh, I think they're well stated. I, I know that they're controversial um, across the range of cognitive science, which includes, of course, philosophers and computer scientists and engineers and psychologists and um, I sometimes think about this um, point that John Searle has raised where he says you know if you could create an extremely accurate computer model of digestion we don't confuse it with doing digestion but we tend it, it, almost what you're suggesting a little trick of mind we he's he's saying people may be confusing simulations of intelligent behavior as intelligent behavior now again this is controversial right um and not everybody accepts that argument but i think it's a kind of interesting insight when you um position it against other complex processes I'm just curious. Uh, I'll just say this to the to the side, and then I'll say what I want to talk about here. But um, Husserl has an essay on the origins of geometry that is very interesting about the difference between understanding and being able to use the vocabulary of geometry. Uh, I learned mm. a lot from looking at that essay. It's absolutely fascinating. But I, I was concerned uh, Thank you. about the 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 um, the embodiment issue, and I think we have a very telling moment right here. Uh, as we come out of the pandemic. So, you know, if you're in, an, in, in a dialogical classroom, you step toward a student or you look at them and so on and so forth. All of these movements are inviting the students in. And I've, I've heard uh, people who are moving now in a hybrid environment where they're both in Zoom and in a classroom. And they're talking about being constrained to the computer, uh, trying to track two audiences and so on and so forth. And it looks like uh, having to attend to a Zoom audience simultaneously to a classroom ruins the embodiment stream and is uh, wrecking the classroom. Uh, I was just wondering if, if uh, uh, Mitch or uh, Ken, either of you had any any comments on this, this phenomenon. I, I don't have a study on this, but I'm just hearing people talk about this. Uh, yeah. And there are others in this group, I think, who also could speak to some of these. I would love to hear it well. I mean, um, I, Martha Alibali and I have done a, we did a, a webinar during the pandemic to try to help parents navigate their kids learning online and the role that they can play um, because of some of these very complex things. And now you're right. Um, schools are asking teachers to kind of 
import some of these practices because, for example, some students maybe because of a breakout or whatever, or we're even being more lax, you know, like because, you know, it's really hard to get to class on time. Um, you know, we're, we're asked to do these kind of hybrid things without really thinking through um, what's lost uh, in the pedagogy. And I, um, I can just relay for myself, it's exhausting. Um, it, and, and let me say, I don't find teaching exhausting. Teaching one-on-one -on -one, I mean, with with face to face, I find it energizing. So at the very least, I just want to sort of point out that. But I'd love to hear from others. Okay, I see that I have a question. Um, so, <laughs> and this is um, mostly to Mitch, but also relevant to the paper by Ken and Mitch on algebra um, from all those years Whoa, ago. Dusting and, it off. Well, and well, we'll see whether it's connected anyway. But so I obviously I have strong uh, sympathies with your embodiment perspective, Mitch, but just to maybe in the spirit of playing devil's advocate, it also seems to me that there is oftentimes a learning progression where people might start off with these grounded understandings, but then they become replaced by these symbolic understandings, exactly because there's this worried about being too buffeted about by changes in context, um, changes in your body, you, you want to end up with a more universal understanding. Think of it like, like the tendency of computer scientists to try to create more and more general solutions that aren't just kludges based upon a specific system. So, so I'm wondering if is that your view of embodiment or on the other hand, I parts of me think that you want to say no, that embodiment never goes away. It's not supplanted by symbolic understanding. So and so yeah, so <laughs> I guess leave it at there. And I think there's a connect connection to the stuff that Ken was talking about too. But. Yeah, I want, I've been talking, so love to hear Ken chime in first. Well, I, I guess, you know, when we're talking about how our minds change in academic settings, it is easy, I think, to get sucked into the symbols that we see. And if that's what you mean, and embodiment is the opposite of that, I'm full on board because it's not about the symbols we see. It's about what changes up here. And it is like you said earlier, Rob, we need to figure out the latent constructs that are changing up here. And if we discretize them sometimes for scientific purposes, and I was reminded earlier in the conversation about the lumper splitter debate in biology, right? Like we, we sometimes split constructs to try to get clarity. Doesn't mean we're saying they don't interact, of course, affect and cognition interact but yeah I, I guess i i think that a related bias we have is that we think most of our learning is explicit when it's just the opposite most of our learning is implicit and whether that's embodied or about the cues and conditions as newell and simon might say is in the details i mean i think it's sometimes and the cues and conditions might be I guess they're always in modalities, so maybe it is the cues and conditions are embodied cognition and that implicit learning of those patterns is what we mean, but I'm not actually sure what we mean. <laughs> so I just put out a book, I don't have it nearby to promote it, but um, on embodied learning and I took a, a, a insight from Alan Newell's um, Unified Theories of Cognition a uh, series of talks <clears throat> by laying out learning across this broad time scale. Uh, and I do consider, uh, Ken, what you're alluding to, like perceptual learning and associative learning um, as a form of embodied learning that, you, as you say, is often implicit on, uh, goes on below conscious awareness. We're not able to verbalize it very well but we're still very much influenced and affected by um, the learning that happens there. And I think that you can talk about um, embodied processes of learning across the wide range of timescales. I take it all the way out to institutions and things like how policies and laws come into play and how they affect education. Um, and in the middle, you've got uh, cognitive and rational and sociocultural kinds of phenomena that we do have very good attention on and we can verbalize. 
Um, I'm reminded of a two things. So your question is actually very rich. It has like multiple questions in it. I'm sure you know, Rob. Um, one is when Ken and I did this work um, with Martha Alibali, one of the really cool things we found is, um, as Ken mentioned earlier, there's a kind of verbal precedence or um, uh, a preference uh, in performance when uh, mathematical information was presented as stories, but not just stories. Um, it wasn't only the context of stories. We had this wonderful condition that we called word equations, which were things like, I have a number and if I add 66 and then divide by 10, I get 42, right? Um, not contextual, but very much a grounding form of representation because people understand language so well and they understand things about language like relations and directionality, so much so that they could invoke these um, informal strategies that they would use for stories. They would use them with the word equations, but almost never use them with the symbols. And one of the reasons why symbol performance was so much lower than uh, stories or word equations was that these informal strategies were way more successful. They were successful up in the 70 plus range, uh, whereas symbol strategies, which were the primary strategies that people evoked when you presented problems symbolically was 50% or below. So um, I think we always interpreted this in the sense that the simple strategies were sometimes less meaningful to students. They could kind of follow them in a routinized way, but they would do really dumb things that you would never do to two quantities if they had a, a context. Like you'd never add a, a multiplier to an add end, you know, like you'd never add in y equals mx plus b, you'd never add the y plus the m but students would do this all the time. But when it was in words, people never did that or extremely rarely. Um, but then we saw this really cool thing, which was we gave people problems that had higher complexity than just the simple linear y with mx plus b problems. And that's where the symbol systems really showed their strength. That's where symbol performance exceeded performance of problems that were presented in words. And one of the arguments I think we made was that what happens with words is they get really complex really fast and they become overwhelming um, to parse. Um, but symbols scale really well to complexities, which I think you're alluding to, which is of course why communities of mathematicians developed symbols and, and, and symbol structures and ways of representing things in the first place is the fact that they do scale so well across the range of complexities. So then you asked, does that mean that embodied processes are operating all the time or do people sort of like, I don't know, like kind of, it's almost like layers of abstraction or something. Is that what you're sort of, I guess, um, alluding to? And I think that is the case. I think that what happens is as you gain facility with um, symbols or any kind of uh, representational inscription system, they um, become your floor um, and you can think about those uh, in object kinds of ways, um, but experts can always unpack them back down to them when they need to. Um, but when you don't need to, it's way more efficient to be working at that symbol processing level and thinking of them as objects. And, and as your work with David Landy uh, has turned out, has shown, we attribute some of the same kind of qualities to aggregations of symbol strings that we do to objects. Like we, we group them along gestalt principles and we think of them as having directionality and we think of them as, as, as objects, um, but they're symbol objects. And so they have their own syntactical rules. And so they carry forth all this efficiency that we want. And one of the important things about symbols is their arbitrariness, right? They're powerful because they're arbitrary, but they're also meaningless because they're arbitrary. So symbols sit in this really funny place that are a very high bar for novices, but very low bar and very uh, computationally powerful for competent agents and experts. Great. Um, thanks, that, that was a great answer. Um, uh, so uh, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, I wanted to thank both of our fantastic talks today. Um, and there is a, a lively chat that is continuing to go on on the side. And those 
uh, materials will be put on our Slack channel in addition to the YouTube for the, the lectures themselves. Thank you and hope to see you next week. Yeah, great.